Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's online event at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Adam Lashinsky. I'm a, a, a freelance journalist and a longtime moderator for the Commonwealth Club. I am pleased to be joined today by former CIA operative Robert Baer to discuss his latest book, The Fourth Man, The Hunt for a KGB Spy at the Top of the CIA and the Rise of Putin's Russia. Robert spent 21 years as a CIA case officer and is a New York Times best-selling author of multiple books about his experiences. His book, See No Evil, was the basis for the acclaimed film Syriana. If I have my facts straight, he was played in that film by, uh, by, by George Clooney. And his works for, the intelligence and, for intelligence and security have appeared in CNN, Time, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. In The Fourth Man, Robert describes that after the arrest of three of the biggest leaks in CIA history, searches began immediately after the elusive fourth mole, who was suspected of having more power than the other three combined. He recounts the thrilling tale of three women leading experts in counterintelligence and their intellectual duel with the supposed mole as they searched for the greatest traitor in American history. Over the next hour, we will be covering the CIA's hunt for this super mole and its impact. If you're watching along with us live, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube and we'll be getting to them later on in the program, about 40 minutes in. Uh, Bob Bear, thank you very much for joining us. Great to meet you. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start, uh, let's start at the very beginning with the, uh, the we, had you, we had your book up on screen already. I'm gonna put my copy of, of it up briefly. Um, who or what is the fourth man? There were three notorious moles in the CIA and FBI. There was Ed Lee Howard, who defected to the Soviet Union. There was Rick Ames, who was famously arrested in February 94, which had given up most of the Soviet Russian assets uh, that the CIA and FBI had in Moscow. And then you had Bob Hansen, the FBI agent, who gave up his share of stuff. Um, and so what happened was the FBI sat down after Hansen was arrested in 2001 and said, wait a minute, uh, the math doesn't work. There were more compromises, many more that they can't explain. They never had access to the information. They couldn't have stolen it. They couldn't have overheard it. It was very sensitive. And voila, they've got a fourth man. And they have no doubt about this uh, until today. I mean, the best people at the FBI in what's called CI4, which is Russian counterintelligence in Washington, are smart people that are well read into this case. So if they said there's a fourth man, there was. We, we so, should, I, should, I should interrupt you. We should, we should pause here because rivalry between the CIA and the FBI is an important part of your book, important part of your story. And I should, I should emphasize for people watching that when you describe the hunt for the fourth man, it's the, it's the FBI's assertion that there's a fourth man that begins this. Is that correct? Well, actually, in 94, there were several people at the CIA that looked at the math and said, no, there's somebody else out there. And clearly, there's somebody in, in the FBI, because there's a lot of FBI assets that were compromised at this point, and the, the C that weren't known to the CIA. So, all right, there's a guy in the FBI, and there's a guy in the CIA, but this is just the beginning of the investigation that was based on a deduction. As in the CIA, they call it a matrix. They're saying, all right, these things were, were compromised in 1984. Rick Ames didn't have access to them. Howard didn't have access to them, and the FBI didn't. So it's an amalgamation of all these leads that are put together that convince people. But it's not really, you know, if I can jump forward until 2005, that the FBI 
finds out absolutely there was a fourth man and they come up with a name. Uh, who was it? Well, uh, you, do you want me to wreck the end of the book? Because the <laughs> book is a thriller. Um, it was the head of, of counterintelligence, the CIA, they landed upon. But as I get into the book, we're, we're talking about the Russians who are constantly feeding the CIA and FBI disinformation. Um, so this is really a book that the reader has got to pick up, look at the evidence, and they have to decide who the fourth man is. We, 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 I, I appreciate that you want to maintain a little mystery uh, because, of course, you want people to read your extremely interesting, entertaining book. We should, I, I should point out to people, you, you said something, I, I read a reviewer referred to sometimes you, you, have, you make lawyerly statements. You said something very specific. I, I asked you almost jokingly, who was it? And your answer was the, the FBI believed it was a certain person. That's not to say that you agree or that there is widespread consensus that this is a fact. What you were saying is this is who they think it was, correct? Absolutely. It's what the, it's what the FBI thinks. Um, I have never seen the original evidence. I could have never got this book through the CIA. If I had been a participant in the investigation, they would have said absolutely no. There right now, the FBI is stonewalling the media on this book on the fourth man. I've heard over and over again, uh, people are calling the FBI and say, we're not going to talk about it. They don't dismiss the existence of the fourth man. They just say, we are not going to talk about it. Um, let's get, you, you used the word evidence a moment ago. And so this, this notion of the evidence about, about a, an alleged fourth man is really interesting in the book. We, 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 we know very clearly, not just what the evidence of, of Rick Ames's treason was, but also the results, right? Many, many people died as a result of, of his, uh, of the information that he passed to the Soviet Union or the Russians. You have an interesting discussion about the, the, the interchangeable use of Soviets and, and Russians, but we know people died as a result of, of, of what Ames did. What do we know or suspect about what the impact was of this fourth man, if this fourth man existed? Well, uh, the, the, Ames is arrested in February 94, and from 1994, until 1998, uh, a lot of new Russians surfaced that we were running sources in Moscow, informants, and they were all betrayed. Um, by 1998, uh, British intelligence, MI6, came to the CIA and said, hey, we've got these five people. Do you know anything about them? Are they your informants, your agents? And we go, yep, they are. And all five of them were pulled out of Moscow. So that by 1999, as Putin comes to power, the CIA does not have a single informant or source in Moscow, which is unprecedented. Not even the worst times of the Cold War did we have nobody. We didn't even have any Russian contacts, the CIA, I mean, that were not controlled by Russian intelligence. Um, it was very clear that there was another problem post Ames. And a lot of these sources weren't known to the FBI. So the problem resided, they absolutely certain, in the CIA and not the FBI. And, and specifically in, and I'm going to get the, I'm going to get the nomenclature wrong, but specifically within the group that, that works on Russia, correct? In Russia House. Yes, it, the, the, the sources were all being ru in Russia House, or a, a Russia group at the time. And uh, one of my sources who has agreed to go public, a whistleblower, headed Russia House. So I'm not getting this secondhand. I'm not, you know, she just, she read the manuscript. She said, you're absolutely right. And then she sat me down and said, I'm going to tell you something else. There's a lot of other compromises I know about, but I'm prohibited from telling you. Uh, the woman who ran what we call internal operations in Moscow said the same thing. I know a lot more than this. The FBI analyst uh, who has been following Russian counterintelligence going back to the early 80s told me, you don't know a quarter of what we have against the fourth man. So I've got, you know, original sources here that are, are telling me uh, it was really bad. And now whether anybody was killed or not, 
I don't know. Um, but, but there's no question that this, the fourth man did an enormous amount of damage. Now, let me dive into the weeds for just a moment, because it's interesting. On the one hand, you have what you describe as an old story, things that happened a long time ago, investigations that happened a long time ago. On the other hand, you believe there's an open investigation in, in, into this person. So could you just tell us one more time um, the chronology, when did this first become an active investigation? What, what, are, the, what are the major events uh, the, of the timeline of the investigation, not the potential tre treasonous acts or what have you? And where does it stand? Okay, it starts in May, 1994, when the head of operations at the CIA forms a very secret unit that maybe a dozen people knew about at the CIA. It was called SIU, Special Investigations Unit, and said, we need to do a cleanup after Ames. See if there's another guy out there. It was that simple. Uh, so you had these three women, uh, two of them I've talked to, the third has died, and the FBI analyst who I've talked to. So they sat down and between May, 1994, and November 1994, they come up with what's called a profile and a matrix. And the matrix says, these assets going back to 1984 were compromised before Ames. They continued uh, until November uh, of the investigation after Ames' arrest, they continued. Um, they took pieces of evidence from the FBI, like what's called starbursts. That's when a Russian mission sends everybody out to confuse the FBI. So one of their handlers can go out and perform an act. So they, they take all, it's, it's very mathematical. You know, you could almost take a, an algorithm and run through it. And what they come up with was that the fourth man started spying in about 1984, was continuing through 1994, and he had been assigned to Langley that entire time. They do an investigation in 94. It is, for, for practical purposes, is inconclusive. And then what happens? Well, it's not inconclusive. It's the FBI agent who's head of counterespionage said, this is great, matrix, fine, but you can't take a matrix to court. It's not evidence. We need to see the fourth man actually making a dead drop communicating, getting money, traveling to a foreign city without authorization to meet a KGB officer, any number of these things, which they can take before a FISA court, a, a national security court, you get a warrant, you get into their financials, you put surveillance on them, you listened. It, it wasn't enough. Ed Kern, who headed counterespionage, so this is the way it works. The guy at the Department of Justice says, I'm not gonna do an indictment. I'm not gonna support a warrant without better information. So what the CIA did at this point was did what was called a probe. And the probe was to catch the spy at Langley. And what it was, was two officers traveled to Moscow, supposedly to make contact with a KGB officer who knew about the fourth man. Um, the moment they got off the airplane in Moscow, they were under intensive surveillance. So what Langley figured out, the people investigating, is somebody there tipped off the Russians. There's, there was no explanation. But at this point, it sort of petered out. They, they couldn't get the evidence. Uh, they figured out that the fourth man wasn't meeting in Washington. He was meeting overseas. Um, there was no way the FBI was going to photograph him meeting a Russian intelligence officer. There was no way that they were going to be able to follow him overseas because he went overseas a lot on brief trips. So it got dropped until 2005, at which point the FBI reopened the investigation and went around the country and started asking about the fourth man by name. They would go to somebody's door, say, hey, we'd like to talk about an old case. We know you're retired, but was there any reason that this man in 1984 would have gone to Moscow? unauthorized. And they said, absolutely not. You couldn't do that. That was a firing offense. Uh, there was no explanation for his going to Moscow. Um, 
So we, we've got 2000, 2000, 2005, 2006, the FBI is traveling all around the country trying to break open this case. And then as of four weeks ago, six weeks ago, since the FBI got my manuscript, they've been knocking on the doors of my sources saying, what did we miss? Can you help us here? This is not hostile at all. They're just saying, uh, we, we, need to, we need to take care of this. And I heard from the Department of Justice that the case is now being reviewed in the East, Eastern District of Virginia, which does the espionage cases. They're looking at it. There's not, it's not a question of lack of interest on the FBI's part, but they need more. And, and any sort of defectors, Russians coming out of Moscow claiming knowledge of the fourth man, they have to take with a grain of salt. It's not evidence. They need a picture of them. They need something. Uh, and this is just the way our, our, our system works. Okay, so we've been in the weeds. There's a, there's a, we're dancing around a very important topic in the weeds that I'm going to, purpose, to purposely defer or delay, which is what we do know about this person and what your thoughts are about this person and what this person has said to you. But let's hold off on that. And I'm going to defer to how you want to tell the story to this audience, Bob, It's because it's in your book. But let's zoom way up. You make a fascinating assertion in your book that this decimation of Russia experts in the CIA in the 80s and 90s led directly to, our, to the United States' lack of knowledge about Vladimir Putin. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the central thesis of, uh, of David Halberstam's book, The Best and the Brightest, that these, in the 50s, the State Department was hunting for communists and ended up firing every left-wing intellectual in the State Department who knew anything about China. Vietnam comes around, we don't understand anything about Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and Vietnam comes. So, your, your contention is that we didn't see Putin coming in part because we had nobody who knew what they were talking about. Well, it, it's, more, it's more basic than that because in 1991, August, there's the coup, uh, which the KGB at one level was involved in against Gorbachev. And, and then, then Russia proceeds to fall apart. I'm going in and out of Russia all the time and I don't agree with this. And at that point, the CIA stopped spying on the KGB. I was overseas and got a message from Langley saying, you can turn off your tell taps on the KGB because we're no longer interested. If the KGB resident walks in and, and knocks on your door, you cannot offer him a cup of coffee. It's not authorized. So we stopped spying on Russia. It was, I was in, in Central Asia dealing with a Russian division um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the commander. And he was asking me money so he could go to staff college. It was all falling apart. I, you just couldn't get any interest. And, and um, let me interrupt you because the geopolitical policy or the geopolitical thinking there was Russia is no longer a threat, certainly not the threat that it was during the Cold War. Let's not make things worse by treating them like an enemy because they're not an enemy anymore. They're harmless. Yeah, don't, no, no witch hunts, first moles, none of this. The, the chief of the division is, I used to work for him. He was, was a great guy, the guy in charge of Russia and everybody at the Clinton White House said, we have to help Yeltsin. We can't be spying on him. The problem was that unbeknownst to us, since we had Ames, Howard, the fourth man, we had no agents, is while we turned a blind eye to Moscow, the K. GB hardliners were infiltrating the government. And there's a, there's a great book on this called Putin's People. Uh, they were everywhere. Putin was in St. Petersburg in the mayor's office, but he was in the system as the KGB people tell me. He was watching the mayor. Um, his KGB supervisors or his mentors, and one of them was named Leonov, uh, who was head of analysis, were, were watching him in St. Petersburg to see how he was doing. He did a fantastic job. And then they promoted him to the Kremlin and he continued to do. So Putin and, and the best minds on this, I think agree, was a front man for what has turned out to be a KGB silent, slow rolling coup d'etat. And it's, it's only now we're, we're seeing in Ukraine where it's, where it's all going. I mean, we, we all saw, you know, the, the assassinations and we saw the KGB people running the oil companies and the rest of it. 
but it wasn't until now we pieced it together. But the problem is this was the CIA's Pearl Harbor because as the ambassador, Jim Collins to Moscow told me, I got better information in 1999 from Moscow taxi drivers than, than the CIA. They, it was of no help. And you know the guys at the NSC, I've talked to all of them, they all agreed there was nothing coming out of the CIA. So between moles and disinterest, we were blinded to, to, to what we're seeing in Russia today. I want to I want to push back on your Pearl Harbor analogy. I, I understand we eventually were attacked for sure in 2016, for, for example, by the by the Russians. And and I'm not quibbling that intelligence on Putin would have been a great thing to have every step of the way. But would would us having better intelligence have changed the situation on the ground in in Russia at all? In other words, might Putin have have done what he did anyway for, in, in Russia? Well, th this was a hypothetical, but people who followed the fourth man at the CIA told me that the fourth man was providing, you know, conversations between Bill Clinton and Yeltsin. These are no disc cables. They were very tightly held. So what happened with these transcripts is they were given to the KGB. The KGB then turned around and, and, presumably Putin himself, and showed Yeltsin, we know everything you're doing with Clinton, everything. You, you can't make a move without us. And at the same time, Putin is protecting Yeltsin from corruption investigations. So was there hypothetically a, a time when, when Yeltsin could have been convinced to choose somebody else than Putin if we had known about him? Could He was thinking about appointing the, the head of railways to replace him or as prime minister to possibly replace him. And could we have had any influence? Could at that point we have given Yeltsin more money to keep Putin out because of who he was? That's a hypothetical. It, it's not like Pearl Harbor where you've got zeros coming out of the sky. But then again, we are not done with Russia. Um, this is looking more like World War III than it is the Cold War. So uh, history is playing itself out, but it's always a good idea to, to get in the mind of the enemy in order to make decisions. I mean, we, we call the invasion of Ukraine, but if we our intelligence had been better, maybe we should have been arming the Ukrainians to a greater degree so that they were more prepared for the 24th of February. There's a lot of hypotheticals here, but you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, no, I understand. And going back to 2000, you, you, you might add, make the further case, it's not like the United States has never meddled in the internal affairs of, of other countries for its own interests in the past. It has many times. So why not then, you're, you're saying? Oh, yeah, but in a diplomatic level, level rather than the intelligence. I mean, Bill Clinton and, and Yeltsin were very good friends. And at some point, and I've talked to the Clinton people, Yeltsin stopped talking to Clinton and he doesn't know why. And, and there's some question whether it was because of these transcripts of their conversations. Um, I, I'm, on a, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on current events. I'm gonna come back to that because it's highly relevant as you've pointed out a couple of times. Um, what's so intriguing, uh, one of the many intriguing things about your book is the number of people who talk to you on the record. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of people who don't talk to who, who talk to you not on the record. Um, talk about the first group. T t tell us some of the people who you name who spoke to you on the record and, and, and why you think they did. Well, let me just say now there are fewer people talking to me today after the book came out than before. <laughs> the people that count said we like the, the book. You got it right. You got the narrative right. You got the story right. And that's people from the National Security Council and the NIL and the rest of it. But what happened was in, in 1995, my boss calls me up and he runs Russia and Eastern Europe. He's a division chief and said, hey, I'm gonna sign three women to your group and uh, temporarily, and they're gonna be working on a project that you, don't know, you can't know about and don't ask. And I didn't. And the lady who sat right across the hall from me, um, she was working what's called a grid. It's an air gap computer. And she was doing all this stuff. I thought it was very weird, but I had no idea what they were doing. As it turns out, when they come to work for me in 95, they are continuing the mole hunt for the fourth man, uh, but not in sight of counterintelligence or the FBI. It was a completely off the books. 
I resigned from the CIA in December 97, don't think anything about it. And then in, in 2016, I think it was, my boss, this guy named Bill Lofgren, were driving back from a lunch and he says, there was a fourth man and this is who I think it was. Uh, and it was, I was stunned because I, I frankly did not believe him. It was improbable. I had seen no evidence of this. I'd never heard word one about it basically. And then he finally, after the next couple of months is what you need to do is reassemble the investigators and they'll tell you their story and which is what happened. And they sat me down for many a day walking through the matrix, what they could tell me, and it's not everything and the profile and what happened to them because uh, they paid the price for naming the fourth man. And so I sat down and then I dealt with the FBI on a certain level and they, they've never used the man's name, by the way, they, they can't, it's an open investigation. Um, and then they are looking for stuff from me, not vice versa. So I, um, I, I you know, I, I assembled the pieces together from original sources, people working on it in 1994, 95, 96, right up through 98. And then I jump to the FBI investigation where it reopens in 2000, in 2006. So it's a, it, this is like a, a Roman mosaic that's been smashed with a sledgehammer and I'm getting all the pieces together and I can only deal with people involved in the investigation. I talked to Clapper, the director of national intelligence and Hayden, they said, I don't know anything about it. The director of operations said there was no fourth man investigation. In the book, I put all these people that are bringing in doubt to this whole thing so that the reader, I can, I can walk them through the route I took. I mean, I'm a stenographer in this. I, I, I cannot comment on the evidence. You can't send me to court and say, this, I just, I'm passing on what I was told. But are you, are you surprised at the number of principals who were willing to have their name used? I'm, I'm asking you what, what your thought is on their motivation for being, for being quoted on the record in your book. They're whistleblowers. They think a, a great injustice was done, not just an injustice, but it was an intelligence failure and, and they want this case resolved. Um, what the FBI is hoping, uh, not that they like this book, is that, and it's being read in Russia right now, I know that, is that maybe it will shake the trees and maybe somebody will come out with the evidence like happened with Hansen. And I said, fine. And, and by the way, I showed the manuscript to all the principals. I showed it to the FBI. I showed it to the CIA. I said it to public affairs. I said, take out, if there's something here that's gonna wreck your investigation, take it out. And they did take some stuff out. Um, and then I, then I went to all the sources that I'm going to tell the FBI and the CIA that you are the sources behind this. And they said, fine, do it. Um, so there's no, there's no small betrayals here. Um, and, you know, like, what can I say? They're very happy with the book. And these, these, these women and the head of the division I've known for many years, and they don't make up things and they don't carry on vendettas, nor, mind you, does the FBI. The FBI agents investigating this now don't even know, they, they, they don't even, weren't there in the Cold War. They're, they're young and they're just, they're just going by the evidence, not, not a vendetta. A, a brief digression, uh, there are these three uh, very interesting women who are central to your story. Um, I was surprised that there were, in, in, in this era, that there were, that there were so many uh, senior women at the CIA. Is that, is, is that, should I be surprised? And what's your, what's your take on that? Well, these women grew up in a generation where they were clerks in a way, and mm. And what, what, they, what they did was they, they, they made sure cases were in order, agent cases, and they just sat in rooms with files uh, forever. And it, they are the institutional knowledge. And they remember what case went bad, when it went bad, you know, who was, who was the case officer. They know all this stuff. Mm. Men tend to go into jobs for two or three years and move on. Mm. So they're, they're, you know, they're, the substance isn't there in the history and, and the memories. And, and don't forget that in, in this counterintelligence case, there's nothing on computers. They can't put it on computers. It's written on three by five cards. Uh, reports are done orally. If there's a counterintelligence case, 
the case officer flies back to Washington, sits down and is debriefed by these women. So their knowledge is unsurpassed. I mean, the FBI could sit down or the CIA and look through my book and, and do a computer search and they're not going to find most of the stuff. Really interesting. Now, you mentioned a moment ago that you know that your book is being read in Russia. Uh, let me make a high level observation and get you to react to it. At multiple points in your book, you, I think, have a lot of respect for the KGB and, the, and, the, and other Russian intelligence services. And uh, you have a profound lack of respect uh, for the CIA where you worked for 20 years. Would you comment on, on my two observations? Well, I mean, it's like commenting about my family. I can pick out the faults faster than anybody else can. And that's just true. You know, it's, it's Fair enough. Yep. you know, these people, you know, their flaws. Yeah. Um, but I also know that the Russians are better spies. And Mike Sulik, the head of director of operations, they just do a better job. That's what that's what they got. And or as one head of Russia operations told me a couple months ago, look, they, they, they never invented the, the, the iPhone. So they're out there, you know, spying and conspiring and do all things like that. And that's what they're good at. And I, I, I love that. I, I wrote it down. You, this person said to you, disinformation is the only thing they're good at anymore. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 was, it was true. And he laughed, you know, and, and, and could they have carried on this vendetta? The FBI won't carry on a vendetta for 20 years, but the KGB will. And as they'll, people tell you, the KGB doesn't have an eraser on its pencil. Okay, I take your point about the Russians, and I take your point about your family. You know, you know their warts, but but you you paint a picture, and it's not the first time you've done this. You paint a picture of an institution that is uh, rife with political conflict and internal rivalries and egos and people sitting on information for to protect their careers. I mean, as a as a citizen, I was I was kind of horrified reading your take. Uh, on the CIA, feeling like they don't have my 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 best interests at heart. They have their bureaucracy's best interests at heart. Is that is that really how you see them? I see them. They're they're islands of excellence. Mm -hmm. um, the people, the CIA, caught Rick Ames using a live Russian KGB officer, counterintelligence officer. I, I can tell you the date. He, he talked about Ames's travel to Caracas. So you have these islands of excellence. These people are doing a great job. And, and it's always been that way, whether it's the Arab world or South America. But it's, it's really the Pareto rule. It's the 2080, um, you know, where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And any bureaucracy, and I'm sure the Russians as well, at some level, are, are the same way. I mean, it's Russian intelligence who stupidly got help get Putin into Ukraine and in this disaster in Kiev. So they, they're not perfect. Um, you know, it, it's like the great linguists uh, that run cases and they're far and few between. Chinese speakers, you know, they speak native Mandarin and they, they learned it, you know, places like Princeton. But generally when the CIA trains somebody, they train them like a, a year of Pashto and they send them to Afghanistan for six months and then they move on to another job. It's a bureaucracy, what can I tell you? I understand. I mean, it's and and then and by the way, I want to remind people watching us that you can submit your questions uh, for Bob Bear, and I'll I'll, I'll get them and I and I'll ask them. Um, let's. I, I want to um, I want to come back to uh, to the to the specific allegation in your book. I think you would like to not name the person that the. Um, FBI believes is the fourth man, though you also present a lot of doubt, not just senior people saying I didn't know, but other reasons that you have to doubt. But I do want to, but anyway, I'm not going to, I'm going to let you answer this however you like, but I do want to ask you, you did speak to this person directly, and this person denied on the record that they are not only that they're the fourth man, but that they did some of the things that they were accused of doing, including a visit to Moscow. So could you, could you address that? Yes, I talked to him, and um, I, I've known the guy. I knew the guy in the CIA. He's sort of a legend, and I found him on the phone very sympathetic. Um, he invited me to come stay with him for a week, um, and and I gave him everything I knew. And he said, "Look, uh, this trip to Moscow. Um, I know I'm being investigated by the FBI. Uh, the timing doesn't work. 
I went to Moscow when it involved my job. He was the branch chief for the USSR. Um, I worked with the Russians after I retired from the CIA uh, for a bit. I went to Moscow. I went to KGB headquarters. Um, at one point, I bought a watch, a broken Rolex watch, which I got fixed and was worth a lot. Uh, otherwise, that I didn't take money from the Russians. Um, you know, I, I'm an intuitive person and my intuition tells me he's innocent. Well, I mean, it's true. I mean, it's, I like the guy. I mean, it's like, you know, he's smart. He's a hero. It, the motivation I've seen the motivation imputed to him is he's arrogant that he thought he could beat like Hanson. He thought he could beat the FBI and the CIA. But then this goes back to, I have not seen the original evidence and I have not seen the three quarters of evidence that the FBI has against him. And do I necessarily trust the FBI's evidence? I don't know. But if I were a juror and I would want to see that, you know, or, you know, sitting in a grand jury, I would want to see that. So if you're, um, if you're only thing I can say is that the CIA, uh, SIU and the FBI thinks he's a spy, you know, but they've got things wrong before. And I've named them in my book. Uh, remember Angleton? Yeah, he, he destroyed so many people along the way. So this is why I leave the reader to make up their own mind. And I put out the other suspects there. Um, the, the Russians in the 80s were compromising Americans in the embassy, in the CIA, are trying to on a regular basis, um, either with women or men. And they take pictures of them. It's called compromise. We all know about it. How many they compromised? I don't know. How capable are they of misleading the CIA and FBI? You got to read the book. You know, you're you're on it, it, you're on the bleeding edge of something that I think is is so fascinating, which is where historians will now analyze this and they'll look back over the last twenty years. And they'll realize we've we've been fighting an asymmetric war, right? Or 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 we in the West didn't know we were fighting a war, but but the Russians were. So they kept this intelligence operation going against the United States. Putin did, and we know some of the results of that now. So I'd, I'd love to get your take on on the present. So let's let's rewind the clock not to eighty six or ninety four, but to February of this year. And, and I'm, I'm going to point out two pieces of intelligence that we're all familiar with. Uh, one, the entire world, including U.S. intelligence, as far as we, knew, we know, thought that the Russian army was going to obliterate the Ukrainian army quickly. Uh, I did number too. Two, okay, I, I'm going to ask you to talk about that. Number two, um, the, the, the president of the United States shared this uh, unusual, extraordinary amount of intelligence publicly saying that Russia is going to attack Ukraine, even though all of you think that they're, they're, just, uh, they're just bluffing with these war games on, on the border. And he said, and, and Putin, we know you're going to attack, so don't do it. Uh, that was right. That intelligence was right. So sort that out. So, sort all of that out for us, Bob, please. Well, the order of battle is very hard to hide. You, you can bluff with tanks and armored vehicles and airplanes and sending 200,000 soldiers, it could be a great bluff. But what we're watching from overhead is loading up ammunition into tanks. They're moving gasoline into the place. Um, there are people on the telephone texting back to their family, say, this is serious. So you, you take this, this, all this context for it, and you say, this guy's serious. I saw that with Saddam going into Kuwait uh, National Security Agency, everybody's intercepting stuff. They were, you know, loading up things for a real attack. It wasn't a bluff. So that's good. But what we didn't understand was how corrupt the Russian military was. But before you and, continue, and, let me let me let me ask you to linger for a moment on your first point because it, you're it's really interesting. You're you're teaching me something here, which is we, we had excellent intelligence, but it was sort of routine excellent intelligence. This isn't suggesting that somebody that we had somehow gotten a microphone into the uh, into the picture frame in, in, in Putin's office, right? We, we were looking at obvious good, hard intelligence. The extraordinary thing wasn't that we had it, but the way Biden was sharing it publicly. Yeah, that is, I mean, and it, and I think he did the right thing, you know, get it out there, see if you can stop the guy, it, this is gonna be a catastrophe for everybody. 
uh, get him to change his mind, you know, make concessions. We don't know the diplomacy going on, but we certainly did not have somebody in the Kremlin. And obviously, I don't know what the CIA sources are, simply because I know these people in the Kremlin are a cult. They're true believers and none of them, and they make all the money they want, are going to go volunteer to the CIA. It just highly unlikely. We never got in the Politburo and during the Cold War. It's, it's not something you can do. It's like getting into the Khmer Rouge or something into their command. It's not doable. Um, so you're left with telephones and, and, and overhead and, and things like that. And, you know, low power intercepts and things like that. And it's, it's very good. Yeah, got it. Okay, and I interrupted you on your, on your next point. Well, we, what we didn't know about is because we don't have anybody with the Russian army. They were buying cheap uh, Chinese tires. Their communication systems didn't work. Uh, that all of the recruits were from the North Caucasus or Siberia. They weren't really ready for a war. They were lied to. They were young, undertrained. Uh, you've got a military command that, that aren't really military officers, that, you know, and on and on. It's it's that it's the, the touch and feel of the Russian army was so difficult. What disappointed me was like when they first went in that night, I was on TV and saying, I said, ah, the Russians are going to get into Kiev in a day or two. Totally forgetting when I spent two years with the Russian army, how corrupt it was. I mean, I was buying anything I wanted, you know, tanks or airplanes was all for sale. Uh, and they were begging for food, the Russian military. But I did not extrapolate from my experience to the current day. And that is, you know, that's my fault. Well, it's again, like, I don't know, books will be written on this. It wasn't, it wasn't just you. It, it was, it was everybody and now you know we're seeing some very good reporting coming out of coming out of russia and out of ukraine right now that's sharing some of these examples you know i've i've been reading how uh you know non-commissioned officers in the russian army are not authorized to make decisions the way non-coms are in, in western in western armies but, but what's striking to me about this is that this seems as obvious looking back just a few months as the as what you told us about about you know, text messages and and the and the makeup of the of the conscripts. We should have known all this too, and and not you, frankly, because you're not an active, you're not an intelligence officer. It, it, well, it's with twenty twenty hindsight, we can all look back, and it's the Russians tell me, look, hey, look, the, the Ukrainians made up sixty percent of the non-coms and uh, ranks up to captain, uh, and they're they know they can fight tactically. They're good, good fighters. Um. I think yeah. I hear your dog in the background. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I put on the outside. Is there, you know. It's an unauthorized leak. Okay. We, we've got some questions coming in from the audience, Bob. I'm going to, I'm going to read the first one. Uh, I don't know. I don't get any intelligence on who's asking these questions. So there, these are just questions from, from the world. Um, did, did the CIA commit an enormous blunder by firing Edward Lee Howard after training him to work in Moscow? It maybe explain the nature of the question because I don't understand the nature of the question. Well, he was caught stealing something off an airplane. He was a little bit, he'd gone, he was drug use and he was stealing something. He was on his way to Moscow. Um, he, he was fired, summarily fired. And, but what you're not, what you don't do with somebody that has all these secrets in their head is fire them. You simply lie to them and say, hey, the Russians found out who you are. We can't send you Moscow. We're going to send you to Paris, the best job in the world. You know, see what see what he could compromise, get, you know, you know, and, and just put him out to pasture. Yes, it was a horrible mistake. Got it. Okay, next question is, is there a relationship between Russian infiltration in intelligence and Russian investments in real estate, especially in places like New York? Look, the Russians have what what they call informal contacts that can collect information from American finance. They can collect information from Trump. They hang around. They can get the context. Um, they have a lot of cultural programs that go on, um, and and things like that. And and they can, they can. If the Russians were listened to, they, they know what's going on in Washington and New York much better than we do in, in, in Moscow, because we simply, the Russians can wander around the United States all they want. We can't do that in Russia. Um, next question is, 
What does Putin think of people like Fiona Hill, who has always appeared to see him for what he really is? Oh, she can't, they can't stand her. Um, and she says what's on her mind and she has that British sensibility. Uh, they hate her. Um, they hate anybody who's, who sees through. And so you know, they, sees, through, sees through the whole thing and she's good. My hunch is that they take solace in the fact that she's, while she's good and while she's prominent, she doesn't have any power and she never has, right? Certainly, well, not, they, certainly not in the Trump administration. The tr no one, no one, no one in the White House ever listens to experts. Rarely do they. You know, go back to the Bay of Pigs. You go back. They they find somebody in the intelligence computer community or National Security Council that you know will, will, will give them what they want to hear. Sort of like we invaded Iraq. Everybody in the CIA knew in two thousand and three there was a revolt that 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 Saddam had nothing to do with nine eleven and that he didn't keep weapons of mass destruction. We had sources that told us he didn't. Yet the neocons just turned them off. I mean, I went to the neocons in 2003 and said, you know, this guy Chalabi, this guy you want to put in power is, is, a, is a fraud, a bank robber and an Iranian agent. And I was just, the people just go like this, just go away. We don't want to hear it. I, I, I totally understand. It's, and it's fascinating. And I suppose it's sort of, there's a good side to having political leadership and control of the bureaucracy. And there's, and there's a bad, there's a cup half full and there's a cup half empty. Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, you can't listen to experts all the time. And plus the experts get it wrong. I mean, they got well, it wrong I mean, about uh, Ukraine, Ukraine fighting back. They do get it wrong. Um, and, and so it's a combination of sensibility at the White House and the inability, the intelligence community to answer certain questions. When you were, um, when you were answering the question about Fiona Hill, my mind went to people that Putin and the Kremlin hate. And uh, my mind went to uh, Navalny and, and, and Khodorovsky. And why is, why is, why is Navalny alive uh, today? I mean, I know they tried to kill him once, but they, couldn't they do it? Couldn't they do it again? They could have easily killed Navalny going to the Russian mob. Just say, go rob him, go shoot him. They've done this before. Why they felt they needed to use a nerve agent is one of the great mysteries. The same way with the Russian dissident in London in 2007, Litvinenko, Salisbury. The Russian mob is all over London. Just go shoot the guy if you really want to get rid of him. But it's... I think it's the message of using nerve agents um, and the rest of it and why they don't kill him. It looked like a bridge too far after they failed once. You think that's the reason he's alive in prison today? <laughs> it's, the, it's the Russian mystery. If you can get inside the Russian mind, let me know. Fair enough. And I'm, I'm going to come to the next question in a moment. I just want to tell everybody one of the interesting things that you talk about in your book is that you did not make your career on the Russia desk in, the, in Russia House. Um, you made your career at the CIA outside of the Russian operations, which I think is what made you, made it interesting for you to write this book, yes? I didn't know anything about this. I didn't know how counterintelligence was done. Um, I've been in liaison with Russian intelligence, but it was just very superficial knowledge of the way they worked. Uh, I lived in, this, in Central Asia and dealt with Russian military, but I, I would not call myself an expert. So I very much come to this story as an outsider as I keep on repeating I'm a reporter in this uh, like anybody else like you anybody else I'm just saying this is what I'm told um, this is my doubts about it and there was a guy at the intercept named Jim Risen used to be the New York Times walked me through well what about this question what about this question and there's a Greek word for it which I think is prokotoleptis it put all the doubt in and every other paragraph and why who's going to object and why they're going to object which is the way I approached it. I don't march into this story saying, I know who the fourth man is. I'm gonna, t I'm gonna tell you, not at all. Great, um, the question from the audience, Bob, is do you, think the, do you think the CIA's demotion after the DNI, this is the Director of National Intelligence, uh, was created, well, sorry, I, I'm, I'll start over. Do you think the CIA's demotion after the DNI was created was seen by the KGB as a victory? Maybe unpack the question a little bit for people like me who, who don't completely, uh, I, I sort of know what this person is talking about, not completely. You know, it, it's, it's a layer of bureaucracy, which I don't think has done any good because a lot of smart people are being taken off the front line 
and sent to the DNI or they're sent to DIA. I mean, one of the great problems of the CIA is it has, there has to be a certain consensus. And, and what you really want is an independent body that should be outside of Washington. It should be in New York or mm -hmm. uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and just get away from the consensus. Um, so I think it's destructive. And certainly the Russians looked at this as hurting the CIA at the end of the day. Um, but but it, it's, not, it's not been fatal. Um, what's been fatal for the CIA is the war on terror because it should have never been the CIA picking targets and arresting people in the war on terror. That polluted the message in a big way and then got the best and the brightest, not going to Moscow, they're going to Kabul and Baghdad, um, you know, for six month tours and they're becoming instant Middle East experts and they get promoted and the rest of it. And we took our eye off Russia and that went on for 20 years now or 22 years. Mm -hmm. That did more damage. Um, I can't remember if you, I think you discussed this a tiny bit in the book, but what's your, what's your assessment today of, of how the CIA, what are the CIA's ability to analyze events in Russia today? And how does that compare with the CIA's ability to analyze events in China today? We, we are finding it more difficult, uh, the more, you know, people are clamped down on. And it's, it's simply, you cannot be assigned to Moscow or Beijing and go out the door and meet a Russian and have a frank conversation. You can do it in London, Paris, New York, uh, but not in Moscow because the FSB, that's their internal services all over the American embassy. And then in China, you have, you know, just the CCTV cameras and the, these closed circuit and biometrics, and you just can't go out and meet these people. It's very, very difficult, as it was in in, in Kabul. You just you can't get out, go out and sit down with Afghans in a night and and chat. So our knowledge of the world is being diminished every day <laughs> as the world closes down. <laughs> Uh, a member of the audience wants to know, do you ever, did you ever talk to General Odom, O-D-O-M? Who's that? General Odom was the national, I did talk to him on the phone once or twice. The man was brilliant. Um, he knew, he knew the way the world worked. Um, I can't remember what we talked about, but I, I was very impressed by the man. And did you do, what, what, what part of your book, what, what part of your reporting was on the telephone versus visiting people in person? Well, once I, I started out visiting people in person, and then once it became clear that they were going to let me go public with this, it was on the phone. And so what I did was most of it was on the phone. I called up people and said, here's what I heard. Why is this wrong? Uh, it was mainly fact checking. So I got the matrix, the profile. I heard about the FBI investigation in 2006. And then I got on the phone. Um, the FBI warned me that um, my phone was has probably been compromised by the Russians and don't ever set foot in Russia. We'll never see you again. Uh, speaking of, you know, I'm, it's interesting as I prepared to talk to you today, uh, Bob, there have been, you know, a couple of really interesting reviews of your book, including by uh, Risen in The Intercept. Uh, but the, you know, what we call the four or five biggest national newspapers uh, haven't haven't reviewed it yet. I don't have, I don't, you said people are talking about it at the FBI in Russia, but I don't see any evidence of, of this disclosure of the magnitude of this important investigation having hit the uh, national consciousness yet. Do you, do you agree with me? And do you have any perspective on that? I haven't seen it either. I mean, I've talked to people the Washington Post and the New York Times, and, and I've offered them, I'll give you the phone numbers of these people so you have a basis for carrying this on. I know that there's one network that would like to get a confirmation directly from the FBI, this is an open investigation. But mm. keep in mind, this is a story that the Washington Post and the New York Times has been after for 20 years, and they're probably a bit irritated that these, the investigators came to me. I'm not saying I did a better a better job than they would have. I'm just saying that you know they're they're playing catch up ball and maybe they'll just ignore it. I don't know. 
A uh, member of the audience wants to know, how do you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine ends? Well, I've been talking to my editor about this, and I think the Russians, and, and this is, I'm a little bit ahead of the, you know, the curve here, are going to win in the sense that they are simply going to efface what they can of Ukraine from the map. They're just going to continue shelling, moving forward, shelling, moving forward. I agree with the CIA director that, and he said this publicly, that Putin is doubling down and, and he simply doesn't care because there's so much, the Russians are driven by fascism and this bloody mindedness of these KGB people that look at the Ukrainians as little Russians, as upstarts, as former slaves, and they don't deserve to have a culture. They don't deserve to be separate and Ukrainian isn't a uh, isn't a <laughs> isn't Russian, and and they just they don't care. And I, and there's you know there's going to go in city after city after city, and I don't see Putin stopping, and he'll probably leave some sort of rump Ukraine. But, um, but you know, it's hard Putin, to project. Doesn't it, Putin's army run out of run out of resources at some point? I mean, I read yesterday they've lost a thousand tanks. Do they have the ability to manufacture more tanks quickly enough to replace the ones they're losing? They're, they're a lot cheaper than our tanks to make, but at this point, does he really need tanks? It's, 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 um, it, it's what they used to call the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars, ABC warfare, artillery, battalion, and cavalry. So you just let the, uh, let the artillery soften the targets up, and then, and then you, you can protect your tanks. And, uh, but you know, predicting the future is hard. Look, I, I, it's interesting to hear a contrarian take. I, I think I'd like for you to be wrong. I think you'd like for you to be I'd wrong. I'd like to be definitely wrong. Yeah. No, I, I understand. So, it, it, but just to push back a little further, it's, it's sort of, it's been frustrating, I think, to people rooting for Ukraine, but the Western sanctions do seem to be working. And so again, I asked you, don't, don't they run out of military resources? Don't they run into real financial problems at, after a certain point if they are a pariah state? Yeah, the problem is that sanctions don't work all that well. They didn't work on Saddam. They didn't work on Iran. Uh, and these regimes were more interested in survival than they were about people being well off in their countries. And so, and there's also the possibility of smuggling. And then don't forget, China is, is backing, is, is, you know, who knows what China can do at this point. They're backing Russia. Venezuela is backing. Right. I was going to say we don't know how we don't know how much though. Like we I haven't, we, don't, we haven't seen hard evidence of China backing Russia, for example, the way NATO is backing Ukraine. But you're saying yeah. that could happen. Yeah, but they're. I mean, are they buying more oil? Are they you know tanker to tanker yeah. transfer of oil? Fair is enough. it enough? I mean, the Russian army is not well paid. It, it's yeah. not like our military, and it's, so they can keep on throwing conscripts at the front. And the average Russian in Moscow, does he really care? Um, I well, mean, and that's my next, and not to be glib about it, but you, you do not believe that there's a, there are enough people who are going to be upset either that they can't get an iPhone 13 or that they can't go to, va to, va to vacation in Mallorca uh, to cause a political problem for Putin. Remember, Putin is saying that the problem is the iPhone, you know, and it's people on it, and it's people on Instagram, and it's soft Russians. And it's the West and it's LGBT he's fighting. And this is a war for him, a, a war of survival against the West. So he's got to keep going. I, I understand. Uh, two last questions from the audience, Bob. One is, um, um, uh, well, <laughs> I'm just going to ask, I think we know your answer. Would Putin's demise influence the war of attrition against Ukraine? That I don't know, because if Petrushev, who's considered the second, comes in, uh, he sounds crazier than Putin. Would he continue it? Um, probably. But again, it's getting in that inner circle. As a former CIA officer, my mind is always, even during the cold, is get inside the Kremlin. Do we really care about what the average KGB guy thinks? No, but get inside the Kremlin. And that's really the thing that's off limits to the CIA and, and has always been. Uh, last question from the audience is, is there a fun story or something that didn't make it into the book that you, that you wish had made it into the book that you can share with us? Oh, there were a lot of them. I mean, it's, well, some of them are too outrageous to even talk on here, but what I did with the CIA is I, 
because I, I got advice from somebody at the Department of Justice says, put everything in a footnote. And then they, what can they say? So I put these horrendous stories about personal failings and weird stuff in there, but I, I can't even talk about it here because it's just unfair. Um, one of the great mysteries of the book was, and, and I got this confirmed, there was an MI6 officer who was run down in a hit and run in London. And a lot of people suspect he was murdered. They never caught the driver. There was no license plate. And simultaneously with this, MI6 and the fourth man caught a penetration, another Philby of MI6. I don't know who it was. And I asked the fourth man what happened. He said, well, the head of MI6 took care of the man. Can I connect these two stories together? Absolutely not. Do I sound conspiratorial? Yes, but it, I do have to wonder. And I hope someday someone takes my story and carries it forward. Very briefly, Bob, uh, because we're out of time, speaking of carrying it forward, uh, do, do you have a next book topic and are you at work on your next book? I am working on a, a book on the gubernatorial election, California 34, Sinclair uh, Lewis. Sinclair that was sort Lewis of her ran against who? Yeah, no, I mean, Upton Sinclair, I'm sorry, Upton Sinclair. Oh, uh, he, he, he ran for governor, him. he ran for governor in 34, and that was when fake news started. It's Hollywood turned against him and destroyed him, and this is what I'm exploring. Um, Who was elected? A guy named Miriam. And, and why, Miriam. and why does, you, and, and it's the fake news aspect that interests it's you? The, it's the fake news, it was the lies, it produced Nixon, it produced American politics today. It just, it's a fascinating period. And if, if I can get my mind around it, I'd like to write, write a book about that or social de decay and global warming because that, that's on the way. Well, good for you for spreading your wings if you, if you do that gubernatorial race in California in 34. Um, uh, Bob, I want to thank you, the author of, of the new book, The Fourth Man, for joining us today. I also want to thank all of you uh, in our audience watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. Thank you to everybody. Please imagine me banging a gavel very loudly against the table and stay safe.